Chapter Ten of the Pursuit of God. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pursuit of God by A. W. Tozer. Chapter Ten: The Sacrament of Living. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. First Corinthians ten thirty one. One of the greatest hindrances to internal peace which the Christian encounters is the common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular. As these areas are conceived to exist apart from each other, and to be morally and spiritually incompatible, and as we are compelled by the necessities of living to be always crossing back and forth from the one to the other, our inner lives tend to break up so that we live a divided instead of a unified life. Our trouble springs from the fact that we who follow Christ inhabit at once two worlds, the spiritual and the natural. As children of Adam we live our lives on earth subject to the limitations of the flesh and the weaknesses and ills to which human nature is heir. Merely to live among men requires of us years of hard toil and much care and attention to the things of this world. In sharp contrast to this is our life in the spirit. There we enjoy another and higher kind of life. We are children of God. We possess heavenly status and enjoy intimate fellowship with Christ. This tends to divide our total life into two departments. We come unconsciously to recognize two sets of actions. The first are performed with a feeling of satisfaction and a firm assurance that they are pleasing to God. These are the sacred acts, and they are usually thought to be prayer, Bible reading, hymn singing, church attendance, and such other acts as spring directly from faith. They may be known by the fact that they have no direct relation to this world, and would have no meaning whatever, except as faith shows us another world, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Over against these sacred acts are the secular ones. They include all of the ordinary activities of life which we share with the sons and daughters of Adam, eating, sleeping, working, looking after the needs of the body, and performing our dull and prosaic duties here on earth. These we often do reluctantly and with many misgivings, often apologizing to God for what we consider a waste of time and strength. The upshot of this is that we are uneasy most of the time. We go about our common tasks with a feeling of deep frustration, telling ourselves pensively that there's a better day coming when we shall slough off this earthly shell and be bothered no more with the affairs of this world. This is the old sacred secular antithesis. Most Christians are caught in its trap. They cannot get a satisfactory adjustment between the claims of the two worlds. They try to walk the tightrope between two kingdoms, and they find no peace in either. Their strength is reduced, their outlook confused, and their joy taken from them. I believe this state of affairs to be wholly unnecessary. We have gotten ourselves on the horns of a dilemma true enough, but the dilemma is not real. It is a creature of misunderstanding. The sacred secular antithesis has no foundation in the New Testament. Without doubt, a more perfect understanding of Christian truth will deliver us from it. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is our perfect example, and he knew no divided life. In the presence of his Father he lived on earth without strain from babyhood to his death on the cross. God accepted the offering of his total life, and made no distinction between act and act. I do always the things that please him, was his brief summary of his own life as it related to the Father. As he moved among men he was poised and restful. What pressure and suffering he endured grew out of his position as the world's sin-bearer. They were never the result of moral uncertainty or spiritual maladjustment. Paul's exhortation to do all to the glory of God is more than pious idealism. It is an integral part of the sacred revelation, and is to be accepted as the very word of truth. It opens before us the possibility of making every act of our lives contribute to the glory of God. Lest we should be too timid to include everything, Paul mentions specifically eating and drinking. This humble privilege we share with the beasts that perish. If these lowly animal acts can be so performed as to honor God, then it becomes difficult to conceive of one that cannot. That monkish hatred of the body which figures so prominently in the works of certain early devotional writers is wholly without support in the word of God. Common modesty is found in the sacred scriptures, it is true, but never prudery or false sense of shame. 
the new testament accepts as a matter of course that in his incarnation our lord took upon him a real human body and no effort is made to steer around the downright implications of such a fact he lived in that body here among men and never once performed a non-sacred act his presence in human flesh sweeps away forever the evil notion that there is about the human body something innately offensive to the deity god created our bodies and we do not offend him by placing the responsibility where it belongs he is not ashamed of the work of his own hands perversion misuse and abuse of our human powers should give us cause enough to be ashamed bodily acts done in sin and contrary to nature can never honor god wherever the human will introduce moral evil we have no longer our innocent and harmless powers as god made them we have instead an abused and twisted thing which can never bring glory to its creator let us however assume that perversion and abuse are not present let us think of a christian believer in whose life the twin wonders of repentance and the new birth have been wrought he is now living according to the will of god as he understands it from the written word of such a one it may be said that every act of his life is or can be as truly sacred as prayer or baptism or the lord's supper to say this is not to bring all acts down to one dead level it is rather to lift every act up to a living kingdom and turn the whole life into a sacrament if a sacrament is an external expression of an inward grace then we need not hesitate to accept the above thesis by one act of consecration of our total selves to god we can make every subsequent act express that consecration we need no more be ashamed of our body the fleshly servant that carries us through life than jesus was of the humble beast upon which he rode into jerusalem the lord hath need of him may well apply to our mortal bodies if christ dwells in us we may bear about the lord of glory as the little beast did of old and give occasion to the multitudes to cry hosanna in the highest that we see this truth is not enough if we would escape from the toils of the sacred secular dilemma the truth must run in our blood and condition the complexion of our thoughts we must practice living to the glory of god actually and determinedly by meditation upon this truth by talking it over with god often in our prayers by recalling it to our minds frequently as we move about among men a sense of its wondrous meaning will begin to take hold of us the old painful duality will go down before a restful unity of life the knowledge that we are all gods that he has received all and rejected nothing will unify our inner lives and make everything sacred to us this is not quite all long-held habits do not die easily it will take intelligent thought and a great deal of reverent prayer to escape completely from the sacred secular psychology for instance it may be difficult for the average christian to get hold of the idea that his daily labors can be performed as acts of worship acceptable to god by jesus christ the old antithesis will crop up in the back of his head sometimes to disturb his peace of mind nor will that old serpent the devil take all this lying down he will be there in the cab or at the desk or in the field to remind the christian that he is giving the better part of his day to the things of this world and allotting to his religious duties only a trifling portion of his time and unless great care is taken this will create confusion and bring discouragement and heaviness of heart we can meet this successfully only by the exercise of an aggressive faith we must offer all our acts to god and believe that he accepts them then hold firmly to that position and keep insisting that every act of every hour of the day and night be included in the transaction keep reminding god in our times of private prayer that we mean every act for his glory then supplement those times by a thousand thought prayers as we go about the job of living let us practice the fine art of making every work a priestly ministration let us believe that god is in all our simple deeds and learn to find him there a concomitant of the error which we have been discussing is the sacred secular antithesis as applied to places it is little short of astonishing that we can read the new testament and still believe in the inherent sacredness of places as distinguished from other places this error is so widespread that one feels all alone when he tries to combat it it has acted as a kind of dye to color the thinking of religious persons and has colored the eyes as well so that it is all but impossible to detect its fallacy 
in the face of every new testament teaching to the contrary it has been said and sung throughout the centuries and accepted as part of the christian message the which it most surely is not only the quakers so far as my knowledge goes have had the perception to see the error and the courage to expose it here are the facts as i see them for four hundred years israel had dwelt in egypt surrounded by the crassest idolatry by the hand of moses they were brought out at last and started toward the land of promise the very idea of holiness had been lost to them to correct this god began at the bottom he localized himself in the cloud and fire and later when the tabernacle had been built he dwelt in fiery manifestation in the holy of holies by innumerable distinctions god taught israel the difference between holy and unholy there were holy days holy vessels holy garments there were washings sacrifices offerings of many kinds by these means israel learned that god is holy it was this that he was teaching them not the holiness of things or places but the holiness of jehovah was the lesson they must learn then came the great day when christ appeared immediately he began to say ye have heard that it was said by them of old time but i say unto you the old testament schooling was over when christ died on the cross the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom the holy of holies was opened to every one who would enter in faith christ's words were remembered the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at jerusalem worship the father but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him god is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth shortly after paul took up the cry of liberty and declared all meats clean every day holy all places sacred and every act acceptable to god the sacredness of times and places a half-light necessary to the education of the race passed away before the full sun of spiritual worship the essential spirituality of worship remained the possession of the church until it was slowly lost with the passing of the years then the natural legality of the fallen hearts of men began to introduce the old distinctions the church came to observe again days and seasons and times certain places were chosen and marked out as holy in a special sense differences were observed between one and another day or place or person the sacraments were first two then three then four until with the triumph of romanism they were fixed at seven in all charity and with no desire to reflect unkindly upon any christian however misled i would point out that the roman catholic church represents to-day the sacred secular heresy carried to its logical conclusion its deadliest effect is the complete cleavage it introduces between religion and life its teachers attempt to avoid this snare by many footnotes and multitudinous explanations but the mind's instinct for logic is too strong in practical living the cleavage is a fact from this bondage reformers and puritans and mystics have labored to free us to-day the trend in conservative circles is back toward that bondage again it is said that a horse after it has been led out of a burning building will sometimes by a strange obstinacy break loose from its rescuer and dash back into the building again to perish in the flame by some such stubborn tendency toward error fundamentalism in our day is moving back toward spiritual slavery the observation of days and times is becoming more and more prominent among us lent and holy week and good friday are words heard more and more frequently upon the lips of gospel christians we do not know when we are well off in order that i may be understood and not be misunderstood i would throw into relief the practical implications of the teaching for which i have been arguing i e the sacramental quality of everyday living over against its positive meanings i should like to point out a few things it does not mean it does not mean for instance that everything we do is of equal importance with everything else we do or may do one act of a good man's life may differ widely from another in importance paul's sewing of tents was not equal to his writing of an epistle to the romans but both were accepted of god and both were true acts of worship certainly it is more important to lead a soul to christ than to plant a garden but the planting of the garden can be as holy an act as the winning of a soul again it does not mean that every man is as useful as every other man gifts differ in the body of christ 
a billy bray is not to be compared with a luther or a wesley for sheer usefulness to the church and to the world but the service of the less gifted brother is as pure as that of the more gifted and god accepts both with equal pleasure the layman need never think of his humbler task as being inferior to that of his minister let every man abide in the calling wherein he is called and his work will be as sacred as the work of the ministry it is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular it is why he does it the motive is everything let a man sanctify the lord god in his heart and he can thereafter do no common act all he does is good and acceptable to god through jesus christ for such a man living itself will be sacramental and the whole world a sanctuary his entire life will be a priestly ministration as he performs his never so simple task he will hear the voice of the seraphim saying holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory lord i would trust thee completely i would be altogether thine i would exalt thee above all i desire that i may feel no sense of possessing anything outside of thee i want constantly to be aware of thy overshadowing presence and to hear thy speaking voice i long to live in restful sincerity of heart i want to live so fully in the spirit that all my thought may be as sweet incense ascending to thee and every act of my life may be an act of worship therefore i pray in the words of thy great servant of old i beseech thee so for to cleanse the intent of mine heart with the unspeakable gift of thy grace that i may perfectly love thee and worthily praise thee and all this i confidently believe that thou wilt grant me through the merits of jesus christ thy son amen end of chapter ten end of the pursuit of god by a w tozer